Please welcome Steve Stewart from Dreamloop Games, who is the head of communications there. And uh, today, Steve will be talking about brand stewardship for body and IPs. Uh, so please welcome him. Hi, can you hear me? Hey there, loud and clear. Thanks so much for having cool. me. Cool. Thanks for, for joining us today. So whenever you are ready, you can start your presentation. I'm just, yeah. Sure. Sounds good. Hey, <laughs> I'm Steve Stewart, and I'm the head of communications and, and co-founder at Dreamloop. Um, this particular talk uh, is aimed at kind of giving you an understanding of, um, you know, methods through which you can uh, navigate um, the treatment of your IP um, in order to kind of build it and, and grow it. And um, this is the first time I've done this particular talk, um, so bear with me if it's a little bit rambly. We'll see. Um, yeah. So a little bit about me. I'm the head of communications at Dreamloop. Um, Dreamloop was founded in 2015, and we're a Finnish game studio uh, making games with heart and teeth and helping others to do the same through co-development, uh, porting, and work for higher projects. And uh, I, I took a brief break uh, from, my, from my time at Dreamloop um, to, to go and work with uh, some other companies, and I'll tell you a bit about that in a moment. I now have, as of November, I think it is, I'll have 10 years uh, in, in gaming and tech, uh, mostly all focused in, in communications, uh, editorial marketing, uh, et cetera. Um, so quite a lot of experience there, including some pretty decent experience uh, in terms of notoriety, I guess. Um, I'm a former Ubisoft comm dev, um, and I've previously worked uh, as a, a marketing manager for social at Zynga on the Farmville 3 franchise. Um, and I've worked in PR, comms, marketing, et cetera, um, across uh, gaming and tech uh, for, for quite some time now. Uh, here at Dreamloop, I serve as the brand manager uh, for our studio, as well as um, our game IPs um, from pre-production all the way through to post-launch. Um, so helping it to kind of find its voice in the initial stages, define what exactly um, each of our games are, uh, define our strategy for communicating that to the world, whether it's publishers or to press uh, or just marketing messaging on the whole. So some projects that I've worked on, and uh, please note that uh, the ones with an asterisk next to them uh, were in a non-marketing role. So I also uh, do production, um, and uh, that's kind of the capacity in which I've worked on, on some of these projects, uh, project management production. But um, our, our upcoming game, Inescapable, No Rules, No Rescue, um, which went into development starting in 2021, um, and that one will come out October 19th. So some of this stuff is pretty fresh for me, and some of the challenges that we've faced are, are pretty fresh in my mind as well. Um, I've worked uh, on Shadow and Bone Beyond the Fold as a project manager for uh, external side. Um, Bloodstream, which is an upcoming Dreamloop IP, um, The Ascent. Uh, I worked uh, as an associate producer. Farmville 3, again, uh, marketing manager for social at Zynga. South Park Phone Destroyer, uh, community developer. And then we have a number of other uh, older franchises, we'll say, um, including Glory, which has had kind of a resurgence. It's a pre-production title. Uh, Stardust Galaxy Warriors, which is Dreamloop homegrown IP as well. And way back in the day, the Rescue franchise, which some of you will remember uh, for its firefighter simulators. Um, yeah, so all of that is to say I've worked on a number of different brands, um, all of these in a, in a marketing um, or public relations capacity or community development capacity. So pretty decent amount of experience there. Uh, brand stewardship. Uh, so to jump right into it um, with that kind of like experience to provide you the context. Uh, in this particular context, brand stewardship is the process of, you know, defining, nurturing, growing, and protecting a brand. So basically building a brand from the ground up and then making sure that it continues to chug along um, on its merry way. Um, yeah. And you can begin this process as early as you have an idea. And I think that that is the wisest um, method to to. Uh, to take. Um, so basically during the pre-production or at the conceptual phase, um, you can already kind of begin to guide where the brand will go um, and what people will, will think of and, and how they will consider it and where they'll position it in their minds. And I think that that's actually quite necessary um, because even internally, the way you talk about the game that you're working on um, will factor into people's decision making. It'll factor into the way that they perceive it. Um, and that might sound 
you know, like a thing for big studios. I guess some of you folks are definitely from indie studios. So when you see something like this, you're like, why, do, why am I thinking about the brand of this game when I'm in pre-production, if I'm a creative director, or if I'm a game design lead? Um, but it's because looking at branding holistically um, and thinking about how do we communicate around, how, how do we communicate what this is, is actually a pretty crucial part of this process. And here are the things that it will help you to do. Um, when you're creating pitching materials that you'll ostensibly send to publishers or you'll send forward to investors or whoever it is um, you typically send pitch materials for, it could even be internal pitching materials. Um, it's super, super helpful. Um, defining your positioning. So saying uh, to, again, a, a publisher or to uh, an internal review board, this is where we see ourselves within either your portfolio or this is where we see ourselves within the studio portfolio or this is where we see ourselves within the broader gaming sphere, uh, the broader gaming market, and being able to kind of define your your rivals and idols and, and say where you sit among them. That's one of the areas where it's super helpful. And then, um, again, just aligning your team when you are, you know, whether it's a big team or a, a small team indie or, or up there, you know, with the large Ubisofts of the world or whatever the case may be, if you have at least the, the formation of the kind of uh, brand that this will eventually have in your head, an inclination, it will allow you to kind of bring others into your vision more easily. And then, of course, it will also help you with contract negotiations. And what I mean by that is not specifically getting more money for your, your game, or uh, though it will potentially help you to do that, having a well-defined brand for it will absolutely boost its kind of um, appeal to publishers. This will also help you to know what are your specific points of, you know, go, no, go within your contract. Um, so, you know, different things like, do I, am I comfortable giving up the IP or, um, you know, am I comfortable signing over movie rights or merchandising rights, all of these different things. And it'll help you to kind of, it'll be a North star in terms of um, your contract negotiations. So, the, the process by which you define your IP and your brand strategy, it, it's always going to go most smoothly when you bring in um, a number of different people from your team. So typically, I think people think that the, that defining a brand, um, that's something that marketers do. And I don't think that that's largely the case. Most of the time, what marketers do, in my experience, is they help you to kind of synthesize that. They help you to formulate that into a, a, a easily communicatable method. Um, but they don't specifically uh, create it. Um, I, I don't think any brand is um, created so much as it is kind of like um, synthesized, I guess I would say. Um, of course, you create different materials around the brand. That's, uh, you know, you create the, the game itself, you create the mechanics, you create um, the different visual stylings. But I think that that's, that all comes from the synthesis of a, of a given vision. So who knows the essence that's that kind of uh, the core of that thing better than everybody who is currently working on it. And, uh, or if you're a creative director or a game designer or whoever it is that comes up with new IP ideas within your studio, who knows that thing better than you and those who will help you to bring it to life. Um, so as always, your project leads are going to be key stakeholders because they work very, very close to these games in practice. Um, and that is typically, you know, your creative director, your art director, your game design lead, um, you know, your senior producer, whatever the case may be, all of them need to have, and I'll, I'll extend this as well to, to marketing related roles. All of them should be instrumental parts of the process of defining your IP and brand strategy. A lot of people think that this only goes to marketers. And in, in my opinion, that's a, a bit of a mistake, uh, because so many other people, you know, anyone with a creative input has a very, very big role to play in transforming, you know, hey, this nebulous idea into something which is clear and synthesized and that can be recreated um, across mediums. Um, and, and that's pretty critical. Um, so yeah, everybody working on it influences it to a good degree. And I think that that's also a very good approach to game development. It's always, of course, great to have, you know, a, a a visionary at the helm or something like that. But um, that can get tiring very quickly uh, if you need to keep coming back to them for every single thing. 
um, and uh, whether that's brand or whether that's you know how does the, how will the game actually work? Um, what is the game like as a product? If you have to keep running back to one guy over and over again or one girl over and over again, whatever the case may be, um, that's that's problematic. So um, here's I guess a little bit of an example is that uh, it might be the creative director who is the kind of like vision leader for your specific project, um, but they then need to. Uh, explain their vision thoroughly um, to the entire team. And mo more specifically, in a like very uh, hyper-specific example, the creative director needs to kind of help to influence and inform the art director, who then can, you know, synthesize, oh, okay, so you, you have this game and you think that, um, you know, at its core, it's kind of inspired by uh, comic book uh, superheroes. Well, that's interesting. How do we visualize that what exactly you know what does this mean for our art direction and our art style because you know traditional uh, flat uh comic book colors aren't quite gonna work you know in 3d so let's let's see maybe we'll do it like this and then they help to synthesize the art direction and then that is also of course it, it needs to be explained thoroughly to an artist who then is able to kind of help you to um to uh make that happen um with your production assets so it, the initial vision might come from a creative director or it could come from an art director or whatever the, the case may be, um, but it is a shared and collaborative process uh, because uh, once you filter that knowledge down, uh, you say, hey, my vision is to create this game um, where you know it's got so-and-so mechanics, um, but it's, it's very heavily inspired by, um, by comic book superheroes. Then the artist might you know, get the, some art direction from the director and, and kind of synthesize it themselves and then come up with a, a couple of cool visual treatments that they then take back and then become a defining characteristic of that particular brand. I think that that's very often the case, in fact. So where do marketers fit into this? <laughs> and uh, I've got a little asterisk here to kind of indicate that um, brand, PR, marketing, community, uh, product management, all of those kind of fit under this umbrella. So um, I, I'm taking a kind of broad approach to how they fit into the stewardship of a given brand. They will help you to define and codify it. So of course, they'll help you in the in the process of creating those things. If you give them a, a seat at the table uh, creatively, they'll help you to def to come up with, you know, the, the core of this thing if you give them a seat at that table. And I would argue that perhaps you should. Um, because there's a lot of, uh, we'll call it interesting knowledge <laughs> that might otherwise, you know, kind of go to waste. Uh, so in the context, for instance, of our studio, um, we have a number of different, um, you know, ways that uh, an idea can come together. Uh, but one of the things we do once someone has pitched an idea or wants to pitch an idea is we run it through a gating process. And those gates are designed to look at a couple of different areas. Uh, how, how well does this fit to our company vision? How well um, does this fit to our current capacity or ability? And how do we see this from a market viability perspective? And we take a look at all of those things um, when deciding to work on a project. Um, and so by giving, you know, I, I would consider myself the, the more commercially minded uh, among the studio, more, you know, vision and community mind, or excuse me, vision and, uh, and commercially minded where those two things like uh, reach a juncture that's kind of where a marketer can help you um, but they'll help you to define you, you know the, what how do you synthesize what it is you're making and how do you cod codify uh, elements of it in order to make it reproducible for things like ads or trailers or copywriting or whatever the case may be um, so that's one of the roles that they play and um, they also come up with different ways to communicate the identity and the and the vision. So it is that kind of like process of synthesis. We'll say you have mechanics and you have a visual style and you have a narrative perhaps and and you have all of these different things. Um, but then how do you distill that to a singular identity that can be utilized to to basically communicate? Uh, and that's kind of an art in and of itself, I would say. And that's where um, your your marketers will kind of. Um, play a, a very important role. And of course, 
uh, when things go into action, we'll call it, uh, once once you've gone beyond just the kind of uh, conceptual phase of a project and, and you start, um, you know, your pre-release marketing and things like that, uh, and well, all the way through until post-launch or live operations or even legacy operations, um, they protect the brand and they help you to maximize its potential. Um, and I think that that's very, very critical. Uh, so what does that look like in practice is, of course, um, you know, you'll have uh, a brand manager, um, you know, down the line, say you're two years post launch and you're doing live operations and team members have changed or whatever the case may be. Uh, and, and maybe you've changed marketing agencies. Uh, the brand manager in that case will be able to, you know, ideally, if you've documented well, they'll be able to say, hey, this is actually, um, you know, this is how we've envisioned the brand. This is kind of... Um, the, the core elements, this is, these are the elements of its identity. This is the tone of voice we use. Um, can you please make something for us uh, for, you know, this YouTube ad or whatever, uh, this YouTube pre-roll ad that kind of fits uh, with, with this, this brand tone. And um, they'll be able to kind of use that, that knowledge to, um, to guide others um, in the kind of like legacy uh, elements of it. Um, and then of course, you know, your, your PR team, for example, um, or, or your head of communications in some cases will be able to, uh, talk with external parties and, and help them to understand, um, Hey, this is actually how we see this game. And these are the key messages that we think are actually important about it. I know maybe the art style is, is what, um, you know, this agency might want to latch onto, but, um, Actually, we think that that's far less important because uh, maybe it's a metaphor or something like that. Uh, it, whatever the case may be, they'll kind of help you to um, to to keep that brand safe and, and keep that brand, um, you know, basically continuing uh, on in its uh, in its journey uh, from a potential perspective. Um, and I think, as I mentioned before, marketers should be considered key stakeholders in the IP, not just. Um, you know, you might not want to get them involved in game design, though they might, you know, if they have, you know, sufficient data points, they might be able to point you in the right direction. It really depends on your kind of like creative process and, and things like that. Um, but uh, when you consider if we want to look under the umbrella of marketers, um, you know, and how they can all, all of the different, um, we'll say all of the different disciplines that are encompassed in that term and what they can bring to the table, not just from the brand perspective, but from the IP perspective, from the identity of the game perspective, there is a lot there, right? So um, say you've worked with the same community manager or community developer on your past three titles or something like that, they're able to bring to the table, okay, well, we have quantified sentiment analysis that actually, you know, said that this core mechanic that we frequently use at our studio should actually be overhauled the next time we do something different to function more like this. Um, or they could, you know, flat out be like, yeah, the community thinks that sucks, <laughs> whatever the case may be. And then, you know, the the PR uh, or the the communication specialist or whatever the case may be might have different angles um, to, to kind of look at. So like, okay, um, this is an interesting art style, but what if we were to move in a different direction, um, you know, that because our art director actually has a really extensive background in um, in painting. What if we were to kind of leverage that in order to make something, you know, uh, the textures or something more painterly? Um, is that something that we think, you know, could could be um, an, an interesting addition? It, whatever the case may be, they, they can still bring stuff to the table. Um, and if you consider them a key stakeholder in the IP, they can be more effective decision makers. So, Typically, you know, you don't want, as I said, one person ha needing to make all of the decisions um, in every area. Um, so when you delegate that kind of um, that power, that authority um, over an IP or, or over an area of an IP uh, to your marketer, um, you can help them to basically be better equipped to leverage the brand that, of the game that you're making. Um, and that also gives them, you know, the ability to uh, the needed authority, we'll call it. Uh, to, to make hard decisions or to make decisions asynchronously without having to go in and check on somebody. If you've developed a game, uh, you know, and it, the core of its narrative is like an, we'll just use an extreme example, is like an anti-capitalist message, uh, you know, maybe the disco Elysiums of the world, um, then uh, 
maybe there are uh, there are things that they can do or say, you know, maybe they trend Jack on social and and hop on um, some new initiative or something without needing to jump back um, and, and ask some, you know, uh, some creative lead or something like that. Is this something the brand would say? And of course, by keeping them involved in the process, keeping them very, very close to the team, keeping them involved in these creative decisions around what the game is, what the game should be, what the game stands for, what the game talks like, what the game feels like, you know, what the, how the mechanics work, um, they're better equipped to overall just, again, leverage the identity of that thing uh, for better marketing results on the whole. Um, and it also keeps them just super connected with the team. They never have to worry about, you know, coming in and getting up to date on, okay, what is this thing um, uh, that I've been away from for a while uh, because they are entrenched in that process. And I think that that's something that a lot of studios should actually strive to incorporate is keeping their, their marketers, their, we'll call it the more commercially minded, very, very close to the, the pulse of the project. That being said, you shouldn't just send them off uh, you know, to do their thing, uh, and, and decouple kind of like development or decouple, um, ideation from, uh, the, the kind of marketing process. I think that that's a very big mistake. Uh, marketers should be an embedded part of the team, uh, in, in most cases. And I think that, um, you know, in the process of creating a brand around a game, um, getting the kind of pulse check from time to time, with all of the other key stakeholders, whether that's the creative director or the art director or design lead or whatever the case may be, um, being able to, to kind of go to them for alignment um, when they do have plans. So um, for instance, when you're in the process of, say you've already got your IP strategy, you know where you're kind of headed. We know, okay, we want this to be a, in five years, we want to have two games and we want to have, you know, a, a potentially a, a web series in the works or whatever the case may be. Um, then you distill that down into your kind of like uh, your actual, um, your brand book, which tells you how to talk and what visuals to use and all of the, and what elements to incorporate and all those things. Then you take that brand and you apply that brand treatment to different marketing initiatives or different communications initiatives through your marketing strategy. And of course that can be funneled further into like, for example, um, your social strategy or whatever the case may be. Uh, that brand book gives you the paint with which to kind of like paint and structure those those different things. Um, but periodically, it's good to go back to those people, um, the creative directors, art directors, design leads, whatever the case may be, and kind of just align on the things that you have been uh, working on to put into action. Um, so don't just leave them alone. Don't just say, hey, we, we gave you a brand book. You're good to go. <laughs> like, I think that that's not not the best decision. Um, all key creators, um, basically are pointing this thing, this thing being the, we'll call it like the ship of your IP. They're pointing it in a direction together. They kind of, they get together, they, they formulate the plan for whatever this, uh, I, you know, where should this IP go? And then the marketer is kind of responsible for guiding it there commercially. Um, rather than, you know, of course, it, and then the creative director is, of course, responsible for um, guiding it there from the whole game experience uh, perspective and the art director from the art perspective design, for, so on and so forth. But the, mark the marketer is responsible for guiding it there uh, commercially. Um, and how you define your IP strategy. So your IP strategy being like, okay, what is our vision for this thing? Do we just envision this? This will be a one-time narrative experience. Um, you know, we want to leave uh, players with, uh, you know, a, a replayable game that has an interesting narrative, um, but it's a one-shot narrative experience. And then we, we don't envision there ever being a sequel or anything like that. Or, you know, do we, again, we want to make this a Hollywood blockbuster IP type of IP, uh, you know, defining that kind of strategy and, and the ways that you do that are going to depend greatly on your specific studio. Um, so if you're artistically driven versus non-commercial, or excuse me, if you're artistically driven, this non-commercial kind of indie studio, um, you're going to pay so much less attention, I think, to the kind of, um, the importance of IP uh, on a whole, of course, you, that's not to say you don't want it to be visually distinct or something like that. That's not what I'm saying, but you're going to pay a lot less attention likely to, um, okay, should we, you know, A, B test 
um, logos or something like that. Uh, you're going to go with the one that feels like it fits right uh, creatively. And that's fine. Uh, but if you're a high performance, you know, if you're a, a mobile studio with high performance targets and uh, you want to, you know, we need a, a top performer in the app store or whatever, then you might be more inclined to test logos or creatives or um, whatever the case may be. Um, you know, you could focus group things or you could ask within the studio or, or um, even hire, you know, marketing agencies to consult, for example. Um, or if you're like Dreamloop, <laughs> you're a forward thinking small studio making premium titles in conjunction with a the publisher, then you have a different methodology um, for defining your IP strategy. And that's kind of um, the approach that, you know, the approach that we take is one of a forward thinking small studio making premium titles. Um, and yeah, so that's a little bit different. So in, in a case like that, typically you would say, okay, who within our organization are the people responsible um, for driving this over the line and ensuring that, uh, and informing our IP strategy, what we want to do with this game, what we want to do with this as a commercial product. Um, and then you bring them all in a room and you discuss and, and develop a vision together. It doesn't actually have to be in a room. Of course, we now work, <laughs> you know, remotely and all that fun stuff. Um, but um, together, those people, those uh, the the people who have an inherent, um, you know, a stakeholder status, we'll call it, get together to define what is it that we're making, what is this thing supposed to be, who is it supposed to be for, who wants to play this kind of thing, uh, is it people who like um, strategy games, is it people who like uh, you know, is it people who don't like strategy games, but this is a strategy game, et cetera, et cetera. just kind of defining, um, what is it, what is the core of the experience? What is the core of its identity as a game, as a product and who do we want to play it? Then of course, defining, uh, what its USPs are, uh, defining what makes it unique, what makes it stand apart in the market, defining, um, you know, how is it, similar to a different variety of games or how is it different from games that are very similar um, and, and just kind of defining what makes it stand on its own two feet, so to speak. And then of course, where does it, you know, how is it positioned within the market? Where will it stand in people's minds in comparison to other similar titles or the game industry as a whole, you know, the, all the games out there, where does this kind of sit? Um, and I think taking time to, to look at this, before you kind of need it, even already in pre-production, um, we'll give you a lot of tools in the arsenal for how you can communicate this game to either publishers, investors, whatever the case may be. And I think that that can all be very helpful. Um, okay. <laughs> so apparently I thought now was a good time to <laughs> remind you that this is very similar to your brand strategy. <laughs> or uh, I've made a very small mistake <laughs> on my slides, which is fine. Uh, but yeah, uh, getting all of those kind of like key stakeholders together to determine, okay, what are our aspirations for this? Um, where do we want this to go? What do we want this? Uh, what is the impact that this should have? Because the way that you treat um, your kind of like brand efforts for a game that you are quite sure, you know, you only want to make one of, right? <laughs> and you, there's no interest in making a sequel or whatever the case may be, um, is probably a little bit different than something that you want to have a multi-year live operations um, you know, type of approach or, um, or you think, okay, this is such a good, uh, like concept and, and we think we can continue to evolve on it so we can make sequels or make follow-up games, or, uh, maybe the narrative is so good we can spin it off into a Broadway play or, uh, you know, a TV series or whatever the case may be. Um, but kind of getting an early pulse check already in pre-production of, you know, do we, do we see this as something bigger or do, is this more of a one-off for us? Um, I think is a pretty decent idea. Then when you've kind of got all those expectations aligned and when you've all answered those questions together, you, you kind of liberate, uh, whether it's the marketer or any decision maker, really, um, when they all kind of know, okay, this is where this thing is headed. They can, they it gives them the freedom to make commercially critical decisions. And this is important for someone in a role like mine, where I often, for instance, um, I'm, I'm one of the three folks who are looking at our uh, our contracts and, and trying to assess like and negotiating these things and, and trying to assess, 
okay, um, what is it that we kind of need to accomplish here um, from the perspective of uh, the business? Like, uh, are we okay with giving up IP rights uh, because we do only see ourselves making, you know, one game of this or whatever the case may be? Um, or, or we're not married to the IP. We just really think that this core experience is something we want to we want to create or this mechanic is is more important to us than the ip rights so getting more money to flesh that out um is something we'd be willing to do or you know it doesn't matter to us if we can make t-shirts or you know we can make plushies from the characters or whatever the case may be when you know what the ip means to you as a studio and and how you want it uh like how you strategically want to be involved with it in the future then of course um you can make other critical decisions like that and then it also, you know, kind of informs you of the resourcing that you need to to request as well. So you've got the now that you've kind of got fleshed out, OK, this is our ambition for this IP. This is our ambition for this thing. Do we need to think long term uh, about the development of the IP? Um, do we see this, you know, we want to continue building on it. Uh, we want to continue its legacy because we love it so much. Um, so do we need to invest more money in brand building initiatives? Do we need to, um, ask and thus ask for basically, and by that, what I mean is, um, for example, a social presence, that's one quote unquote brand building initiative is, um, basically after launch do we need to con do we want to continue to build on this ip um by having it stay active on social so that we can one day do a sequel um you know that could be the kind of decision making that you can inform by knowing your aspirations for the thing yeah and again brand building budget could be everything from okay we want to have a community manager for three years on this because we know that we want to make a sequel again uh and that sequel will take us a year and a half uh to develop or two years to, whatever the case may be um so knowing what to kind of ask for or knowing where to apply your focus um in terms of hey you know working on reviews isn't as working on securing uh the largest amount of reviews we can isn't critical for us uh you know for media instead what we should do is focus on creators because they're going to be our gateway into um our gateway into getting people to play this uh this UGC game or whatever the case may be so you kind of get a a, a more informed barometer of how much budget you need and, and how much effort you should put into long-term brand building. And I think one of the things that defining the IP strategy does is it gives you a very, very critical ability to, you know, making those commercially critical decisions is just so important to being an effective brand steward, somebody who can, you know, be able to say without question, no, we would never be willing to, you know, give up the, I, the IP rights or um, no, we think that merchandising is actually something we want to hold on to or conversely, we're really, really looking to give away the, the merchandising rights because we know that it's not going to otherwise be commercially leveraged, uh, things like that. Um, and it, it keeps you from having to go back over and over and over again and, and circle the wagons and come up with, um, you know, an answer for these questions. Um, when you get what you want for the IP, you can begin forming a cohesive brand. Um, so if we look at IP strategy being the starting point, and then that informs the kind of decision-making progress for whatever your, we'll call it like commercial or, or biz dev heavy hitters are, whoever's pitching your game outward or whoever's, um, you know, discussing your game with press and media um, eventually. Um, once we've got those people sufficiently informed with the street with the strategic components you can begin that process with that same marketer or commercially minded person or maybe an external agency if you want to of actually building the brand with those other key creatives and in that case you break out those key stakeholders again and when i talk about making this into a cohesive brand this is the point where you would probably actually want to uh, this is probably after pre-production has begun and you're already starting to move in the in the direction of uh, you know actual development um you can then circle the wagons a bit if you have uh, the time hopefully <laughs> um to get the creative director and the art director and the game designer and um you know your business development team or whoever the case may be to actually flesh out what is the kind of like uh, what is the brand around this uh, how does it look how does it talk uh, what are its you know uh, visual motifs things like that um and and then you can also of course 
take different approaches to this, right? It could be, hey, we're not a super commercially minded studio. We really just want to make awesome games. Um, and we want this to be, rather than as approachable as possible, we want this to be as authentic to the vision as possible. Um, and so we're going to take a creative first approach with our brand stuff. So we'll never do trend jacking. And th these are all things that you would, of course, put in your your brand Bible or whatever the case may be. Uh, and typically that is actually just a bunch of like word documents or, or presentations or artboards slapped around and like into a Google drive folder somewhere, but, uh, or you could take a scientific approach. Maybe you're the opposite of that. And you're like, we want to make this maximally palatable to as many people as possible. We're going to AB test everything, our color scheme, our logos, whatever the case may be. We're going to, um, you know, see, how do these? Uh, how does this brand tone resonate with with people within our target demographic? Whatever the case, um, yeah. But at its core, um, this is all about saying we have this thing, we have this game. Um, this is our vision for it. This is the the kind of these are our inspirations. These are our aspirations. These are um, this is what it is, or what we hope for it to be, and then distilling that down into uh, a clear or concise definition it doesn't have to be a specific word but hopefully you know you can get it done within a couple of slides or whatever to kind of say this is what it is and this is how it talks and this is how it sounds and 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 these are the things that it's like and these are the things that it's not like um you know the things that it's against or something like that defining that kind of brand and, and where it's positioned for that title yeah what is the game's identity or essence yeah written steve says it better than spoken steve could um, uh, and, and what is at its core? Uh, I think the, those are, those are critical. And this is again, why I said that, um, defining your, uh, IP strategy is, is similar in some ways, um, to your brand strategy. Um, and messaging is also another critical component. So, um, your game can be a thing, but the way that you talk about it, the, the way that you describe a thing or the things that you say about that game, um, are of course very, very important, right? So for Inescapable, um, which is a game that we have coming out, uh, as I mentioned, October 19th, everybody should go wish list it, do me a solid. Um, uh, the, it is essentially a hybrid visual novel, but we kind of looked at it and we were like, is, is it being a visual novel actually the most critical thing for us to convey when the story about it is so heavy and, and, uh, you know, well, not, not always heavy, but we'll call it, it, it has intense subject matter. Intense, I think is, is maybe a better word. Um, is it most important that we convey that it's a visual novel or is it most important that we convey that it is intense? So rather than calling it a VN, we just, we made the messaging decision to call it a social thriller, um, because that conveyed more of what you would experience from it than it just being a visual novel did. Uh, because the visual novel is a, uh, can, that kind of treatment is just a means to an end of delivering narrative. Um, so kind of, you know, in this process of developing the brand, Yoni, who is the creative director, and I, we sat for hours just talking back and forth about like, uh, because of course you have to remember development is ongoing the whole time. The story is being written, all of these things, but we could talk about motifs and we can talk about ideas and, and that can all inform the messaging. So the marketing messaging is out, you know, a year or more in advance of the game even being mostly done. And, and so that's why it's kind of like, uh, important to take the time to understand what it is you have. And, and from that, you know, synthesized DNA, create messaging, create, um, you know, again, visual motifs for expressing it, uh, if, if for expressing its brand identity, all of those different things. And of course, it's tone of voice, um, right? Because the game wasn't even, you know, halfway written, and we already needed to go live on social in order to start drumming up um, interest in it. And it's very, very hard to feel like you have your finger on the pulse of a thing if you're not very, very close to it. And if you're not taking that dedicated time to ensure that you understand it and that you have defined it and, and, and truly understood it, um, even, even in advance of it being done. And of course, there's other more practical stuff like uh, here are our USPs, here are the features we'll list on our Steam, whatever the case may be. And all of those are important in defining how you're different as a game um, and how, yeah, 
and how you're different as a, a we'll call it a product experience if that makes sense that all sounds very dry that's not the type of <laughs> like that's not the type of language i would typically use but i think it's important for like accurately conveying what is what is happening here uh speaking of things that are important for actually conveying what is happening here um you get to kind of uh of course uh determine what your visual language is as well as what your actual language is um uh, yeah those are all quite quite critical and then we'll get into some practical tips here um and one of them is that you might not want your creatives to get bogged down and work like this because you're like, well, we have a marketer. We have a marketing team. The publisher has a marketing team. They can handle all this. That's a terrible idea in my opinion um, because like I said before, no one knows the thing, the essence of the thing you are creating the way that you do. And I, that you is a collective you. It's your game studio. It's your, uh, your creative director, your art director, who, not just them, but every person touching it. Everybody whose fingerprint, even anyone who brushes past it, uh, you know, anybody who, um, you know, provides some kind of input that later on gets synthesized in the mind blender of the creatives involved, uh, you know, yeah, you don't want to just entirely outsource that and say, okay, we'll have them do it because then they might need to come to you for every single small question they have, if you're lucky, or they'll just do whatever they want with your brand. And um, I can't think of a more horrifying thing for an indie studio than having someone just do whatever the hell they want with your game idea uh, in terms of, you know, it's, it's brand and how they depict it. That's a, a truly terrible scenario. But if you adequately inform them, this is, you know, this is our uh, vision for the IP. This is our, you know, what we believe is the essence of the, of the game. And this is its brand. Then they're empowered to kind of not need to come back to you all the time. Um, and uh, of course, this is also a, a good thing for the kind of like core creatives involved because also if they're like, hey, that's not something we think, like even if it's an effective marketing uh, tactic, right? That uh, an agency or a publisher or whatever would employ, maybe it's not true to uh, the brand. And so ensuring that all of your um, initiatives, whether it's, uh, your comm strategy or whether it's your um, social posts or whatever the case may be, making sure that they align well with um, the goals outlined in your IP strategy and also the identity outlined in your brand strategy. That's quite critical. Then, um, yeah, one, one tip that I would say is actually very, very important is, excuse me, is to protect and preserve your brand. Um, so, you know, don't let people wield it willy nilly. You know, that's why it's important to actually define what it is and what it isn't and how it speaks and, and what visual iconography you use and all of those different things because of the fact that it is an actual tangible asset. It's one of the few that game studios actually have for the most part. Very few, you know, like own the property in which they have their office, for example, or whatever the case may be. But an IP can be a tangible asset. Um, and it, sure, it could, if it's a one-off game, maybe the tangible asset is actually, you know, to, uh, you know, an outside party or something like that. It is uh, its back catalog sales or something like that. But it can also be an asset for the future. If you have a, a great game in a carefully crafted world and, and messaging and a brand identity that resonates, like uh, maybe you do want to do a sequel one day, or, you know, maybe you want to do a remaster or a remake, et cetera. So not letting people just, you know, whether your game has aged a little bit and it's less relevant, uh, not letting it be, you know, misused for uh, revenue management or something like that um, is, is critically important. And in that vein, um, you need to treat your brand with respect. Um, so if you are even five years post-launch, you know, still checking um, social copy or whatever the case may be on occasion, or your brand manager is who, whoever handles that um, with the publisher to ensure that the way that they're talking about it is still consistent with the way that you want the, the brand uh, received, that is a form of diligence that I think uh, will lend itself to um, others respecting the brand as much as you do, um, which I think is pretty important to protecting and preserving it. So in that vein, um, for me, this means oftentimes as, you know, the, the brand manager component of, of my job, 
I have to double check marketing copy. I have to double check top line messaging to ensure that, um, you know, it's consistent with the kind of commentary that we want to present about the game. Um, I'm double checking assets to make sure that, okay, are we using, uh, or ideally I'm doing this, sometimes they slip, <laughs> but are we using the right logo? Because we have changed at, at one point, we changed the subtitle of the game. Um, you know, okay, the, you know, maybe, uh, a partner wants to have social posts go out um, and it calls your your um, reverse bullet hell a shmup or whatever, just different things like that. So ensure, double checking all of those things and treating your, band, your brand with respect, uh, no matter how much time has passed, is, is a really good idea to help protect and preserve that. And then, you know, this is a pretty important one, uh, uh, specifically for a lot of indies, but uh, maybe this is a message that <laughs> some publishers will, will hear. Um, I don't know, but unless your publisher has bought the IP, the fact that they're using the, the, the brand that you have created for this thing, no matter how nebulously you may have defined it, they are working with a borrowed tool. Unless they have purchased the rights for that IP from you, they're working with a borrowed tool. Now, if you want to bring them into the process of making that tool, whatever the case, the analogy is a bit weird, but like if you want to bring them in the process of, of doing that, that's totally up to you. That's totally fine. But I, in my opinion, um, that, that brand that they are utilizing the brand voice, the brand tone, all of those things, um, you know, that is, that is your tool, so to speak, unless they've purchased the IP. So ideally they won't have any problems with you kind of you know, double checking marketing copy, uh, double checking assets. Of course, all of this is predicated on you kind of knowing what you're doing. So there could be uh, some, um, you know, disagreements or, or things like that. But at the end of the day, it's a borrowed tool and, and you should ask them to treat it with care. Oh, and that's it. Uh, 45 minutes. Um, yeah, I'm going to open it up for questions if there's anybody there who has them. Um, if not, I'm Steve Stewart. I'm the head of communications at Dreamloop, uh, and uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I will never call it X. Uh, I don't care if there's a fire. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so please do. Thank you. Yeah. Th thanks a lot. Um, yeah. Same for Twitter here. Yeah. I get you. Um, yeah. Actually, we have a couple of questions for you, and we still have some time left for them. So yeah, the first one is um, considering um, indie developers, uh, how can they work on brand stewardship? Because it's usually a matter of money for them and it may become quite a problem for them to allocate extra costs for that. But is it yeah, possible but... to for them to maintain their game's brand um, at, at least at the minimum level with uh, like low budget estimates for that? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, and I mean, if you're talking about developing a brand, th that is a little bit, of course, more difficult. Gaining brand awareness is not, in my opinion, the same thing as practicing good brand stewardship. But what you can do as you're part of this equation is you can make sure that you have a clear picture of what your thing is, what your game is at its core, so that you know how you can or cannot or should or should not talk about it. Um, and then making sure that everything you put out, if you put out anything at all, I, you know, even on your own personal social media or something like that, or talking to your mom or talking internally to the team or whatever the case may be, you make sure that it's consistent with the messaging that you have created for what this thing is. Uh, because that's the important part is, you know, everything else on top of it is just tactics for growing awareness of that thing. But what you can do is you can define what it is and you can use, you know, that message reinforcement over and over again every time you talk about it to help other people see that consistently. Um, other than that, I mean, uh, the actual component of, of growing a brand is, is perhaps um, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> But, but yeah, I mean, those are the kind of things that you can do is that you can make sure when you're talking about the game, you're, you're providing consistent messaging. And if you're going to publish images or videos or whatever the case may be, that they illustrate what you think are your USPs, all sorts of stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thank you so much. Yeah. No uh, okay. The next question is, uh, well, you've mentioned that the community managers uh, are also somehow belong to brand stewards and uh, should a good community manager possess any kind of marketing or business related skills uh, to better feel the brand's positioning or tone of voice, uh, et cetera, et cetera. No. So, you know, I use that term pretty, when I say marketing, um, 
what I mean specifically is basically like any of the communication around what this mm -hmm. thing is. Um, so when it comes to a special skill set, I think that they need the ability, and this goes for every single marketer across the board, they need the ability to understand, to, to take in ideas from someone else and distill it into an accurate vision of what makes a thing special, right? So if you say our game is, is, is this, and our game, uh, you know, our game is um, a, you know, well, you could say our game is a hybrid visual novel uh, mechanically, but it's really a narrative driven story about what happens to you when you're in the most insane circumstances. They're able to kind of say, okay, so, you know, you could, you could kind of say that maybe this is taking it a bit too, too granular or making too many like jumps, um, but they could then say, all right, so what's actually critical here? is not you know the the gameplay mechanisms but it's actually the characters uh within this within this story um so if you know your community manager is is talking about studio priorities or something like that and of course you want to vet this with your with your team prior but they could be like yeah you know we know that um our character art could use a little polish but um that's actually not as important to us as making sure that our dialogue is refined or whatever the case may be. And they can align expectation. So like the ability to kind of synthesize what a given thing truly is uh, will help them in their ability to communicate things like what's important to the team or studio. And I, I don't think that that's marketing specific. I think it's just about being able to understand vision and use that understanding to synthesize messaging. Got it. Okay, thanks. Um, and uh, do you think that all types of games need brand stewardship? Um, I mean, uh, do like small mobile, like hyper casual, hybrid casual games, do they need some kind of action regarding uh, brand stewardship as well? I would say that, you know, every single brand of, of any kind, like, um, could, could make use of good brand stewardship, right? So just basically um ensuring that you have con so what happens if you have poor brand stewardship you might have outdated assets uh in your uh, you know twitter header um versus the logo that you show in your uh twitter image or you know you might have outdated store copy that doesn't necessarily match the latest development version of the game whatever the case may be um all of that is about good brand stewardship so making sure that you have consistent messaging and the way that you present it is consistent. It, it just, it gives you a higher overall appearance of quality. If you have taken a mindful approach to what you intend to say about this game um, and ensuring that, you know, again, brand stewardship is also about ensuring that your copy is up to date, ensuring that you're using the right logos, ensuring that uh, the right, um, you know, headers have the right color because it basically helps to create the cohesive vision of what this thing is and present it more effectively and more attractively to the world. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Okay, then. Um, well, I don't see any more questions, but uh, well, yeah, thanks for sharing your uh, contact info. So yeah, yeah please feel free to reach out to Steve whenever you you have yeah. any questions. Yeah, thanks a lot. It was a very interesting talk. And uh, we hope you enjoy games gathering so far. And, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the time. And um, if you have any questions or if that was a rambling, incoherent mess that everyone is now dumber for having listened to, like, just let me know on Twitter and uh, I'll revise. <laughs> Thank no, you. no, no. I, I think it was great. So, yeah, good job out there. And, Thank yeah, you. well, uh, have a great rest of your day. And me we too. hope to see you with new lectures here. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Have fun at games bye. gathering. Thanks. You too.